Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Corey Garland. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a policy advisor for the Women Project. Um, the Women Project is a statewide organization based in Rhode Island, and we're dedicated to building a strong movement that harnesses the power of art, activism, and advocacy to dismantle systems of oppression and uplift the voices of people in our communities. We wanna shift power and shape policies to push for real and lasting change and to advance reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and uh, before we get started today, uh, we must acknowledge um, that we do this work for justice within the context of uh, great injustice throughout history. And we do this work on land that was stolen from indigenous persons in a country built by enslaved and oppressed people. Um, if you don't know where the land that you're sitting on today actually uh, belongs to, please visit native-land.ca backslash. Um, we must do more than simply acknowledge the violence and racism perpetuated against indigenous folks. We must act to dismantle white supremacy and to support indigenous-led grassroots change and Black-led movements and campaigns. Um, we're excited to partner today with the Louisiana Coalition for Reproductive Freedom on a series of panels this summer bringing together leaders from across the country to discuss groundbreaking programs and policies. Lessons learned from our work in the past legislative ses session, and of course, to share resources and ways for everyone here to get involved. Um, we kicked up the series last month with a panel on expanding access to contraception, and the video is available on our social media channels, and it's totally worth checking out. But today, super excited, uh, we're here to discuss Crisis Pregnancy Centers, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. They're also known as CPCs or fake clinics. Um, basically, these places lie to shame and intentionally mislead people about their options around pregnancy, abortion, and contraception. Uh, you've probably seen billboards um, or signs in a town near you, um, things that say like pregnant and scared, question mark, uh, free pregnancy tests. And it sounds pretty innocuous at first, but once you dig in and you start to hear from people who actually visit these places, you realize that it's a much more sinister tone to all of this. People these centers uh, visit these centers to obtain free pregnancy tests or seek abortions or in our need of accurate medical information and prompt medical attention. Instead, they receive judgment and deception. They talk about a person being scared, acknowledging how difficult an unintended preg pregnancy can be, and then they prey upon that. Recently, um, at least something that I've noticed is that in addition to CPCs being in the news and people within the movement working to uh, dismantle or disempower these structures, they've popped up a lot in social media, uh, not, excuse me, and um, pop culture. So for example, Recently, there was an episode of The Handmaid's Tale that detailed very well what happened at a CPC. Uh, there's also a movie that came out several months ago at this point called Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, that also does an excellent job portraying what happens when a person finds out that they are pregnant or believes they're pregnant and goes to one of these centers. I strongly encourage you to check out these things. Um, sometimes it just, uh, seeing an artistic portrayal of one of these uh, clinics really drives home the tragedy behind them and the types of myths that they're perpetuating. Um, these fake centers are not new. They've been around since basically Roe v. Wade uh, the Road v. Wade decision occurred. Um, and they now outnumber abortion clinics greatly. Um, for example, in our little blue state of uh, Rhode Island, we have two abortion providers. Both are based in the uh, Providence area and we have 11 CPCs, 11. And some of them are mobile. So they can go all over the state, whereas there are people who live an hour away from Providence with no means of transportation uh, the CPC will come to them, whereas the abortion provider is literally an hour away and they'll have to figure out how to get there. Now, and we're in a state that's actually pretty, um, I don't know the best way to put this, but 
relatively friendly to abortion providers. Um, in other states where clinics are basically non-existent or they're facing medically unnecessary restrictions, um, CBCs are thriving and they are really just sweeping in and making matters much worse for people who are trying to get the abortion care that they want. Um, the effects of these clinics are just so devastating on people. Um, we need people, we need real advocates to empower people to make the medically accurate decisions about their health care. And that is not what these clinics do. Um, so I'm going to stop rambling on and I'm going to start turning to um, this wonderful panel of experts here. Um, I will chime in a little bit uh, at different times, but um, let's start with Travis Bally from NARAL Pro Choice America. Um, can you talk about the ways that fake clinics prey on young people, low income folks, and communities of color? Can I? Absolutely. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Corey. Thank you to the Louisiana Project for Reproductive Freedom, the Women Project. Thank you to you all for attending. You all are the majority that supports reproductive freedom. Um, so I can absolutely talk about how um, fake clinics target certain communities. Before that, I want to say that I am speaking as an individual, um, mainly because I am here to learn as well. Um, and I'm going to provide, let's say it, the high school equivalency that you need to know on fake health centers. By the end of this panel, you're going to have your master's degree in fake health centers and crisis pregnancy centers. So let me make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I want to do some quick context setting. Corey, I'm going to get to your question, but I'm going to answer your question by sharing a personal story of one of my friends who actually visited a fake health center. But before that, if you don't mind, I wanted to just quickly provide some context. You may have heard different things. Um, like Corey said, some folks call it crisis pregnancy centers. I call them fake health centers because that's what they are. They are anti-choice organizations that intentionally lie to, shame, and mislead pregnant people seeking an abortion. Um, and their goal is to block them from accessing care. Let's be clear, pregnancy, um, these are time sensitive decisions and a pregnant person's health and well being should always come first. Now, if you're here, I know that you agree that everybody deserves to have access to medically accurate, comprehensive, unbiased, information they need in order to make personal decisions about their lives, their bodies, their futures. They don't deserve this information. My friend who went to a fake health clinic did not deserve this information pushed by activists in these fake health centers to stop or delay abortion care. Um, so uh, let me uh, give you some bit more context and I'm, I'm gonna get to Corey's question. Um, look. These centers, they frequently push health disinformation. I'm gonna give you a few examples. When I talk about my friend, I'm gonna use a different name. My, let's say, let's call her Anjani. My friend Anjani's experience at a fake health clinic. But they have a reputation for frequently pushing health disinformation and falsely claiming that abortion poses health risks. You don't have to trust me. Trust the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that have repeatedly stated that there's no evidence whatsoever to support these fake clinics, medically inaccurate and deliberately misleading claims. Okay, now some few examples before I get to my friend Anjani's story. They have had a well, these fake clinics have had a well-documented history of some of the following stuff using deceptive advertising, running misleading websites, and engaging in a variety of other dishonest tactics to lure people seeking information um, about their full range of healthcare options to lure them into instead visiting these fake clinics. And the fake clinic's aim is to ultimately stop them from accessing abortion care. So these fake clinics, they call their target audience, a lot of them call it abortion-minded um, individuals. That is their target audience. If you don't believe me, check out the documentary 12th in Delaware. Hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Um, and I have friends 
who have attended college where there was a fake health clinic on their campus. So they have a deliberate strategy for where they locate for targeting young people, for example, for targeting communities of color. And I know I only have a few minutes left. So let me really tell you, we have a lot of experts that are gonna share a lot of amazing facts for you, but I wanna share a story. My friend, Anjani, um, found herself, uh, found themselves um, possibly pregnant and they needed to know for sure. So they were actually on their way to a drugstore with their cousin. And that's when they came across a building that looked like a medical office and it advertised free pregnancy tests on the outside. They went in um, and they were asked by the persons at the fake health clinic if my friend Anjani intended to have the baby or an abortion. And look, my friend was not sure at the point. They just wanted the test. Again, they went in because they saw an advertising for a pre free pregnancy test. What they were subjected to was um, being put in a room to watch a incredibly outrageously false film um, about a lot of different um, falsehoods about abortion access. Um, and when my friend Anjani realized that something was not up, not what she was signed up for, um, she got up and left and she was accosted by the nurse there saying like, don't do it, killing the baby is a sin. And over the course of the next three days, my friend received her, uh, harassing calls from the fake clinic. Harassing you, like, have you made up your mind? What's going on? They, they were very frequently calling. So I hope that provided the context that you were looking for. I know I have about one more minute. I'm just seeing if there's anything else I'd like to say. The main thing was, I just want you to know, this is not some abstract political debate. Every single day, there are pregnant individuals, or even people that are just seeking accurate scientific information that find themselves against what being, being falsely advertised to go to these fake health clinics. That is unacceptable. I'll close by saying I got involved in this movement because there was a flyer on my campus at American University linking abortion to breast cancer. Again, a complete medical falsehood based on the American obstetricians and gynecologists. And it was put up by a local fake health clinic. And the first thing I thought about was my mom when I saw that flyer, because my mom was brave enough to come out to me as having access to abortion care. And I could only have imagined as she was making that decision, being fed disinformation through things like flyers and it filled me with rage. And I've channeled that rage to productive activism. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you all so much. I look forward to learning from the other panelists. Thank you, Travis. Um, just a kind of a, a follow-up question there. So um, what do you think the impact is on um, targeting these individuals who are facing health disparities? such as lower income communities and communities of color? Time is money. Mm -hmm. And a lot of fake clinics know that. And they know if they can delay a decision, it just gets more complicated to access time sensitive healthcare. And they know that and they're exploiting that and that's wrong. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things that always sticks out to me because they're advertising free services. And we all know that our healthcare system in this country is completely broken and it is inaccessible or unaffordable for most people. So a person sees, oh, a free pregnancy test, great. Oh, a free ultrasound. Well, that sounds like an official medical test. But little do people know that when they walk into these clinics that there is no doctor, there is no uh, ultrasound technician. There might not even be a nurse. So even though like any person on the street can buy an ultrasound machine, they might not know how to use it. Um, so it is, it's really just, it's entrapment, it's terrible. And like you said, this delay, this, the, the ultimate goal is to prevent abortion. And how do they do that? Uh, it's by delaying person actually seeking the care that they want and need. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, 
So these, these, these centers also target rural communities, um, which also tend to have less healthcare facilities as a resource. Um, Ariana Ibarra from NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio is going to talk to us about how these clinics are targeting rural communities. Good afternoon, Ariana. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. Um, so could you tell us a little bit how these clinics target in rural communities? Um, what should people know and what is your organization doing about it? Yeah, definitely. So um, there are tons of CPCs in rural areas here in Ohio. Um, so we have nine actual abortion clinics. They're all in cities or in metro areas. Um, you compare that to the about 100 fake clinics we have around the state, um, which was, you know, hand counted, <laughs> but the, like last summer, um, you know, absolutely wild. Um, and so, yeah, they have a really huge impact on rural communities, just right because of that disparity right there in the numbers. Um, and there's really like seemingly nowhere else for people to turn because these places are masqueraded as being real health clinics. And so you think you have this super convenient place, you know, right in your little downtown um, to go to that has these free pregnancy tests that might have the free ultrasounds when in reality, you know, they're the places that Travis just described. They're, they're horrible. Um, and yeah, and, and in these areas too, um, like take uh, like Southeast Ohio, for example, I lived um, in Southeast Ohio for about five years. Um, in Athens County, which is home to High University, one of the bigger um, state universities we have, um, there's a CPC um, in the city of Athens and in, in Athens County. Um, there's also a Planned Parenthood and also a hospital. People don't know about the Planned Parenthood being there at all, and they, they don't provide abortion at that clinic. Um, and the hospital that's there is basically the only hospital for all of Southeast Ohio, even outside of the county. Um, whereas, you know, those other counties though have fake clinics still and they have, um, there is, I know one mobile clinic that's in that area and they have plans to start another um, mobile fake clinic as well um, in what is right now the poorest county in Ohio. They're getting ready to have one of these mobile um, fake clinics going around. And so, you know, you have to drive perhaps outside of your county to go to a hospital or go to an actual reproductive health care clinic, whereas we have this bus or this bus that's about to, you know, be there driving around and bringing that stigma and shame, you know, right to your door, basically. Um, and yeah, so it's just really predatory, um, especially in, you know, an area that is so poverty stricken. Um, the top six poorest counties in Ohio almost all border each other, all in Appalachian, Southeast Ohio. Um, and the money, so Ohio is one of the states that gives state funding to fake clinics. Um, our budget just, um, you know, is wrapping up now. We have $6 million in our state budget for the next two years going directly to fake clinics. Um, and that $6 million comes from TANF funding. So they're directly, you know, pay, like putting, you know, millions of dollars into these clinics that, um, you know, the only purpose they serve is to dissuade people from getting an abortion and, um, you know, and those, and it's, you know, has like a double impact on this area that is so poverty stricken, like that $6 million could be going towards providing food to families, you know, there's such bad food insecurity in that area, um, or, you know, literally anything else besides something that seems so, um, I don't know, whenever I tell people that these are uh, state funded, they're like, how is that legal? <laughs> like, why is this a priority, you know? Um, and yeah, so I think the, the impact on rural um, communities is definitely, um, a lot of it has to do with income inequality and poverty and things like that. Um, you know, especially in an area, you know, like again, like in Appalachian, Southeast Ohio, where um, on top of this lack of funding for real healthcare and this, you know, overbearing presence of fake healthcare clinics, um, there is, you know, uh, like some areas in Southeast Ohio where people don't even have like internet access. And so even if they wanted to find where to go, um, it's kind of like they might not know where to turn since they, you, you can't do that. You know, there's the libraries and stuff like that. And, um, but it's still not, you know, those libraries only have maybe a couple computers and you still have to drive to get there. And a lot of people don't have mm -hmm. transportation. Um, and yeah, so it's just, um, you know, so many things on top of each other, lack of transportation, you know, 
spotty internet access or the ability to afford it if you can get it in your area um, and things like that. And, you know, like Travis said too, like when you, like you're just running out of time when you have to go through all of these obstacles and, and things like that. Um, you know, in Ohio, uh, like if you're in Southeast Ohio or other rural parts of Ohio, all the clinics are gonna be about an hour away if not a little further, maybe two hours. And that's if you're lucky enough to get an appointment at the clinic nearest to you. You know, I am in Columbus right now. I have friends who, even though we have two abortion clinics in Columbus that have still had to drive to Cincinnati or Cleveland to get their care um, because the clinics just get so, you know, bombarded with, with um, appointments because there's only nine of them, you know, and we live in a pretty populous state. Um, uh, in comparison. So, um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's a lot, um, in those areas, uh, for sure. And yeah. And I mean, you just say that, I'm sorry, that $6 million amount just took my breath away. Yeah. I mean, that is, an, um, that is an insane amount of funding to go to these places that, that aren't regulated at all. Like that's just it. When you think about how ridiculously and overly regulated abortion providers are in this country, even in states that again are more um, friendly to comprehensive uh, healthcare, it is still just shocking. And when you start to do like any type of like digging, so the, the Women Project has been working on um, a report exposing the clinics of our state. And again, <laughs> again, your numbers in Ohio make me remember how small our state is one, but again, like, again, proportionally, that kind of makes sense. Like if we have about 11 clinics in the state, um, but again, in larger states, um, in states that have even poorer populations, it's just more difficult. If you live in a small town, I'm originally from Missouri. If you live in a small town in Missouri and you're, you don't have a car, there is no bus. The only place in the state where you could go to get abortion care is in St. Louis. How are you gonna do that? And there's a 72 hour waiting period. So of course you see a place that's gonna offer you free services, you're gonna jump at the chance to go. Um, it just really is, it's, um, it's criminal. The deception, really. Yeah, and that six million, um, um, in addition to, we have $2 million going to abstinence only um, programming. Um, and so that's, you know, $8 million that he'd be going to, to better things. Um, it's ridiculous. <laughs> It's, and yet we have the, the 24 hour waiting period um, here yeah. as well. So, which is still ridiculous. Uh, so, I, obviously, like, okay, so <laughs> we've like, like a very bleak picture on this Wednesday afternoon for people. So, let's try and like, let's talk about what we're doing to, to change things. Um, advocates, activists are pushing back. Um, so let's kind of look at the different ways that people are challenging these harmful fake clinics. Um, so I'd like to introduce Repro Action's Caitlin Blooney, and uh, she's here to talk about some of their efforts. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to affirm everything that Travis and Ariana said and just emphasize again that being able to get compassionate and accurate information about your health needs and your options is essential to being able to make decisions about your body, your life, and is really integral to the right to bodily autonomy. So at Reproaction, uh, we have a campaign that we call the Bad Faith Medicine Campaign. Um, and we define bad faith medicine as biased, ideologically motivated counseling and healthcare. I want to put healthcare in quotations there because it's really anything but that, um, that anti-abortion agents uh, perpetuate. That care often consists of lies, misrepresentation, shame, and can also lead to people being denied care. I know we touched on this a little bit already, but being told that you have more time to decide or less time to decide um, can really limit um, the options people have to make decisions about their bodies again. Um, so we've done a lot of work on this issue. Um, and one thing that I think we're probably most known for is leading bold direct action outside of these crisis pregnancy centers. So 
Um, I've done them in the DC area, but we've also done them in Missouri, Arkansas, Wisconsin, um, and a handful of other places where we go with signs and um, flyers and we essentially let people um, and specifically people in the neighborhood know that this is not a real clinic. Um, and help redirect to where can you get resources for free diapers? Where can you get free pregnancy help without the ideological BS? Um, another thing that we do at ReproAction is we've been doing a lot of work tracking down the questionable finances and unethical practices of these uh, fake clinics that are receiving our federal dollars. So figuring out um, how this money is spent and specifically what type of oversight exists. And unfortunately, the answer to that what oversight exists is little to none. Um, another thing that we're doing is equipping activists with information on how they can take um, action in their own community. So if that's something that you're interested in, we have informational blogs and webinars, as well as a fact uh, book on how they work, as well as a toolkit on how you can take action. And the last thing I wanna uplift, which is I think probably my favorite resource at ReproAction, we have a database that lists every fake clinic uh, in the United States. It is open source, so you can use it however you want. But there's two things in particular that I wanna uplift from that. So if you go on there, you put in the name of your town or your zip code, all of the fake clinics in your community will pop up. Two things that are worth noting on that database is um, we list whether or not that fake clinic has an affiliation. So one of the big myths about fake clinics is that they're small, uh, like mom and pop type shops, or maybe they're an offshoot of a local church when rea in reality, the overwhelming majority um, are affiliated with larger fake clinic chains. So chains, chains such as Heartbeat International or CareNet. And this is important because these fake clinic chains, these networks, give them funding, they give them resources, the flyers, the brochures. And then if that fake clinic wants to take legal action, they also have those resources um, behind that. And we're starting to see that. We saw that, of course, at the Supreme Court in 2018 with Nifla v. Becerra. Um, and we likely will see more of it. Um, and the other thing that's on our database that I want to uplift is we have a new section of whether or not these fake clinics talk about um, or advertise abortion pill reversal, um, which is an unproven experimental I don't want to call it science or healthcare because it's really not. It's a it's a method being pushed by by um, abortion opponents that is not real and not rooted in science. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, yes. So again, just here in Rhode Island, when we were starting to do some digging on the clinics here. Uh, CareNet is definitely a sponsor of two of the clinics. And it's also really interesting because of their uh, institutional money, they're able to actually have real websites as opposed to just like a Facebook page. And again, that, may, that legitimizes it to people. You know, if you do a Google search for abortion provider and this comes up and then in tiny, tiny little font, they'll have like three pages in that says, you know, we do not provide abortion, right? Something like that, like it's their, their catch all. But again, you have to like keep digging and digging. And again, a lot of people when they realize or think that they may be pregnant, enter panic mode. And so they're not seeing this tiny little print. Um, yeah, it's really awful. And if you do look in the finances, another thing that's really interesting is the, um, if you start to look at how they're registered as businesses within the state, uh, because there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's perfectly legal to do business ads, right? But there are so many like fake names and if you keep digging, you keep digging and then you suddenly realize like, oh wait, this is completely funded by like Right to Life Rhode Island, right? And then you're like, oh, of course, right? Or you look at their, you know, their corporate uh, mission statement, which is basically like quite, <laughs> and again, these were very, very old articles of incorporation, but it was like to prevent abortion, like that's their entire goal, nothing else, right? That's their educational purpose is to prevent that. And again, like, it's just, it's rich, it's ridiculous. And um, you kind of want to shout it from the rooftops that like, this is, this is, this is just obfuscation. Um, so a number of cities and states have tried to regulate these clinics and it's led to some intense litigation. Uh, the National Women's Law Center's uh, Heather Shoemaker is going to talk about some of these cases around fake clinics. Good afternoon, Heather, how are you doing? 
Hi, Corey. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, I have the pleasure, I guess, of talking through some of the legal challenges. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, there's there's a lot more losses than than wins to talk through. So I also want to kind of explain why that why that is. Um, and you know, like others have said already, it's it's really hard to regulate these like clinics. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on like why that is, and then you'll see kind of how we got to some of these challenges. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of laws that govern the practice of medicine and protect consumers. And, you know, the abortion fighters on the phone, like, are very familiar with the number of laws that regulate their practice. And, you know, folks have mentioned abortion is, like, like wildly regulated. So um, we're kind of dealing with the opposite here with CPCs. So um, for, for those medical providers who are real medical providers, they have to abide by the federal law HIPAA that exists to protect um, uh, confidential protected health information. They are regulated at the state level through medical license and medical malpractice. There are data protection laws. There's consumer protection laws that prohibits them from engaging in unfair and dishonest practices. And there's a mechanism for the attorney general or a consumer protective agency to, to enforce those laws. Um, so that all sounds well and good, um, and it is for those that they regulate, but CPCs typically provide free services, like we talked about already, and they um, they don't often have business licenses. So uh, they also don't typically have licensed medical um, practitioners on staff, and they themselves are not typically licensed as medical practices. So because of all that, they're not actually they're, they kind of slip through the cracks, right, of all of those laws that exist that govern the practice of, of real medicine. Um, so for that reason, you know, advocates have been trying for years to figure out ways that, that, that we can regulate them, um, try to print, uh, pass a number of proactive laws that protect people from the harms. And as folks before me have mentioned, a lot of the harms come from people going to CPCs because they think that they can get um, certain services. They think they can get an abortion there. They think that they're actual medical providers there, all of which we know are not true. So a lot of the efforts that have um, that advocates have taken to regulate them have been largely about trying to just get them to disclose certain information, like you know what services do you actually provide, who do you actually have on staff, so people know what they're getting um, if they choose to go to a CPC. So in several instances, courts have struck down these types of regulations um, at the state level because. In the court's words, they were not written carefully enough to avoid First Amendment rights of CPCs and uh, compelled speech. So a couple of examples. Um, for example, in Baltimore City, the city passed an ordinance that required CPCs to post signs in their waiting rooms that said that they don't offer or refer for abortions or birth control. And it, a failure to comply had a fine that it was associated, associated with it. Um, you know, I think probably to everyone on the phone, like that seems pretty reasonable. Um, unfortunately, the CPC did challenge that ordinance on, um, in part on First Amendment grounds. And the district court enjoined the ordinance. Um, and in part because they basically said that like, you could have used existing regulations that, that combat fraudulent advertising to, to combat the CPCs rather than having a whole new law. Baltimore appealed that decision to the, the Fourth Circuit and um, the court ultimately struck down the ordinance. This was in, in 2018. Um, and they didn't say directly whether the ordinance was constitutional, but they, they basically alluded that it wasn't written tightly enough to um, avoid treading on First Amendment rights. And I think, you know, if you're hearing that and thinking like, well, that seems wild because abortion providers have to say all kinds of things. Um, and we have, I won't get into it because we only have so much time, but um, we have seen different results whenever abortion providers have challenged some of the bias counseling requirements that, that, that they have um, on themselves and, and what they have to say to patients. Um, another example, then I think, I think it was Caitlin who, who mentioned it very briefly, the Nifla v. Becerra case um, in 2018, the Supreme Court heard um, this case where NIFLA, NIFLA is the CPC, challenged um, the California's FACT Act, which, again, required CPCs to notify um, people seeking services that California provides free or low-cost services, including abortions, and give them a number to call. Um, 
And the FACT Act also requires unlicensed CPCs to disclose that they're not, like, they are not licensed to provide medical services. Again, like, seems like it should be pretty simple and, and not that unreasonable, but unfortunately, the court ultimately held that that law violated CPC's First Amendment uh, free speech rights. Um, one thing I did want to flag with that decision is that the court, um, in part, reasoned that California hadn't exhausted all of its efforts, like they hadn't done a public information campaign or tried other initiatives to um, get that information out there. Um, so I think those are pretty disappointing, <laughs> pretty disappointing decisions. Um, so I did want to like uplift a couple proactive things that that have not been um, successfully on the part of CPCs anyway, challenged. Um, Hawaii passed the law in 2017 that creates confidentiality requirements for CPCs. And um, when I first started talking, I had mentioned HIPAA. Um, this, this law basically extends the, the protections under HIPAA to CPCs. So that like, you know, as one of the courts had mentioned, like you could have just used one of these existing laws. Well, Hawaii did just that. So that's actually kind of, um, cool that's like, a, like lawyer cool i guess um the other thing to i think lift up and i've seen some folks in, in california and new york and a couple other places do this um taken straight from the language in NIFLA, you know saying that like well you could have done a public education campaign so some advocates are like fine we'll do a public education campaign um and right after the NIFLA decision new york was um, one of those places they launched a public health campaign that um, you know, specifically uh, provide people with comprehensive, confidential, medically accurate um, reproductive health care services and like where they can actually get like real health care services and put ads through um, like subways and buses and in places where people are really going to see them. And then just this year, we saw a couple bills introduced. They were just introduced. They weren't passed at this point, but I think it, it's cool to see some of the creative ways that, that states are thinking about this. In um, Arizona, introduced um, a piece of legislation that would mandate that um, ultrasounds that CPCs are doing that are actually performed by someone who is licensed to do that or certified or like receive some training. Um, and in Texas, Texas um, again just introduced, not passed, but we saw a couple of bills introduced to um, make CPCs um, follow reporting requirements, which like. If you know, abortion providers have to report tons of stuff, so like, seems fair to hold them to a similar standard. Um, and another bill to create some minimum standards for, for CPCs. So I think there is some, some room for optimism, but um, thus far, a lot of the, the court challenges have not been great for us. Heather, um, what type of resources is the National Women's Law Center um, able to provide to uh, advocates in different states who are interested in, um, you know, pushing one of these in their next legislative session? Yeah, um, so we, we actually, I pulled a lot of this information from some of the research members that I have done for state advocates. So like if you, if you are a state advocate that is, is interested in this, um, we certainly have um, legal fellows and legal interns. I think one of my legal interns is listening right now. Shout out to, to Jordan. Um, and they've done a ton of tremendous research to, um, to support state advocates whenever they, they want to look into one of these laws in particular. And we, we're happy to look into your state's laws and, and see where there might be opportunities um, for you to introduce something. That's excellent. And uh, actually, Caitlin, with Repro Action, um, I know that you're, you're doing a lot of grassroots work and getting out there and raising awareness. Is, are there certain states that you're um, intending to target or should states, state advocates reach out to you if they want help in bringing some of your work to their state? Uh, for, for folks on the line as well, we right now are taking local action uh, in the DC area. Um, Missouri is one of our states. Um, and we do have somebody in North Carolina. We haven't been able to do much uh, with the pandemic, but that is another state that we have a presence. So um, if anyone on the line is in those states, I encourage you to reach out. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so Connecticut, one of my neighbor states uh, just had a big win on pushing back on deceptive advertising. Um, and Amanda Kipperling from the Women's Center is here to tell us about it. Amanda, how are you today? 
Um, wow. What wow. does SB 835 do? Um, thanks for asking. Um, it's great to be included in this wonderful group of folks who have done so much on the local level. Um, and we were successful um, because of all that had been done by folks on the ground and then also by folks who were able to chime in from a national level. Um, so a bit of a timeline just to help understand um, how we ended up with a win. Um, the Hartford GYN Center is the only independent abortion provider in Connecticut, which similar to how you were explaining Rhode Island, um, you know, should be a friendly non-abortion hostile state because it's blue. Um, but this is when you find out how people really feel about abortion. When you find out um, who's referring to these fake clinics, um, who's helping to legitimize them, um, and you look into um, sort of the back door of all the deceptions, um, not just on their advertisements, but also, as you mentioned, with funding um, and other things. Um, so we, our uh, clinic is located in a area where other businesses provide different social services. Um, it didn't take long um, when a suite opened up in our complex and a fake clinic opened up and called themselves uh, Hartford GYN or Hartford Women's Center. So um, very obviously trying to compete with us, um, we immediately started to unravel who the leadership was, their connections, which as you mentioned earlier, um, not only included national organizations like Heartbeat International, but some of the more nefarious groups such as Priests for Life. Um, and there was very real ties to people who had criminal histories, um, histories of violence against abortion providers, including our own clinic. Um, in fact, the person who opened up um, the fake clinic, and I'm not gonna continue to use their name, um, the person that opens that up and became the spokesperson for it, was arrested inside of our building for trespass, for get, coming inside of our clinic and refusing to leave. So they actually had a criminal history of offending abortion providers, patients, and guests. Um, the reason why they chose to put their building, or excuse me, put their facility within our building area was to directly compete with us, as they said, um, and also because in the past we had made it so hard for them to reach patients as Travis said, the abortion-minded uh, people, um, we had made it difficult for them because we called the police when there was trespassers, which is exactly what you should do. Um, so the leader very clearly said they wanted better access to patients and having a common space with an abortion provider would allow them to reach their targeted audience. Um, the story certainly that Travis touched on is reminiscent of what we hear every day from our patients. And um, abortion providers across the nation experience this type of, uh, I think we're, we receive those sad stories quite often. Um, and they do deceive patients into thinking they're further along in their pregnancy, um, that there is a time limit to the decision-making process, um, or they set us up to be um, thought of as not legitimate providers. When in fact, when you expose them, you find out that's quite true of them. Um, early on, we were very lucky to have great support from NARAL Connecticut. Um, the folks there were able to immediately partner with um, volunteers outside of the clinic to meet with patients and center the patient's experience in this. Um, we collected stories from patients who were willing to share testimonies about what had what they had experienced um, in trying to attempt to get services from our clinic, but being either physically intimidated by the protesters coming out of the fake clinic or through the lies being spilled by the, the, um, the fake clinic that was staffed by protesters. Um, and we also had an awesome experience where the um, organization Abortion Access Fund was able to come and paint the entryway into our clinic and it's brick. And so we were able to get them to paint it yellow. And we had the wonderful opportunity of giving people the um, clarity that our clinic, the one with legitimate, compassionate healthcare services um, was at the end of the yellow brick road. And so it was very fun to be able to say that 
Um, and that's not a normal opportunity for people. So um, I'm also grateful for the work of groups like ReproAction who are able to bring in the grassroots and activism that's necessary in order to do proper, pop, uh, proper education, I think, um, and really expose them for the embarrassing tactics that they're using. So thank you for that. Um, what we wanted to do was be able to engage with city council. So the first thing we did on our way to um, SB uh, to the to the bill was um, work with city council, who was immediately freaked out um, that from a small business point of view that this was happening as the only um, independent abortion provider that was happening to us, that it was happening right under their noses in Hartford. Um, and also that it was so obviously connected to a fake clinic. So city council received a lot of pushback um, from out of state protesters, um, but yet that wasn't enough because the constituents of Hartford were able to connect with lawmakers and help to explain the, the need for that local care. Um, so we were very successful and able to work with local politicians and get the support there. So to circle back to your question, um, uh, the bill now, which was signed into law just last month in June, um, we were able to sign that into law because we had such widespread um, desires to want to right the wrongs, um, to do a proper education. And um, what it does now is similar to what you've seen with the um, Supreme Court and also in California, which does require signage to be used. Um, that signage was almost immediately used by the um, fake clinics in Connecticut immediately after we started with city council. Um, and so it was funny how they already started to see that they needed to use the language that we were putting out because they knew they were going to lose. So we started to see immediate positive effects of our work that way. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out the side effect of this was finding out who was referring unknowingly to these organizations. Um, when you, I'm so proud of ReproAction for putting together a list of um, a national database like that because what we were finding out was that Connecticut, innocent Connecticut providers um, who in the heat of the moment when a patient said, I would like to get an abortion or I'm looking for a free ultrasound or a pregnancy test, they were automatically Googling things. And you could see, of course, through um, expensive nationally funded organizations, they were able to say, come into our organization, you know, come to our state clinic and get this work done for free. Um, so there was providers who were unaware that they were referring to these deceptive places. Um, and so a, another side effect, which was a positive of the bill, was the opportunity to alert the wider medical community that there was um, this major falsehood. And also just to reclaim that space that um, patients were looking for, which was with a legitimate healthcare provider. What is that? Um, what is the required signage that this bill requires, this act requires? Yes, um, so it requires them to say that there is no medical providers on site, um, which oddly enough was something that they were already willing to say. Um, so the big clinic 50 feet away from us was also saying, you know, this really doesn't apply to us because we don't have medical providers on site. So that was a nice gift <laughs> um, that they gave us. Um, and, you know, the work we did could not have been done if it weren't for all the grassroots support that we got. So I really owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to the folks who volunteer outside of abortion clinics. Um, and as an abortion care worker myself, um, I was not responsible for this action. And so a ton of debt and gratitude goes to my colleague, uh, Roxanne Sutaki, who was able to work with NARAL Connecticut and others to help make sure that this was something passed. Um, I also wanna thank you guys for um, offering this as a recording later so that abortion care workers who are currently running clinic later on today can get the opportunity to hear all these great resources and this success story. So um, they can adapt it as well too. 
Awesome. I, one, one more follow-up. So um, would you be willing to share, I know you said that, you know, uh, Abortion Access Fund and NARAL Connecticut were some of your um, partners in getting this legislation passed. Are there any other uh, groups that you would like to kind of give a shout out to at this point? I mean, the, the, there's a very long list. And I think, um, <laughs> you know, so much of it was um, done with the mutual respect that we were finding um, organizations who had already felt this way. So there were so many different organizations from the LGBTQI community who had already suffered experiences like this. Um, and so we were able to partner with them. Um, there was religious organizations who were concerned about um, the fake work of people of faith um, doing this. So um, there was met many members from the um, spiritual community um, NARAL Connecticut, I will be indebted to Abortion Access Fund, the National Institute for Reproductive Health, um, the National Abortion Fund, tons of people who were just really helpful in making sure that we got the legal support that we needed, um, we got the grassroots support that was um, required. Um, and also um, John Oliver, who loved our yellow group road story, yeah, was really thrilled to list that um, and uplift it because it was such a hysterical sight to see um, the sign when you op when you went into our um, building area to see our clinic and across the way was the same name of our clinic, um, but they didn't have a yellow brick road, so. Right. Oh, that's great. I love that. I do. I mean, that's something here in Rhode Island. Um, you know, we're a very Catholic state, which really influences a lot of like what we can get passed in our General Assembly. But that's why it's so important for us here to make sure that we're tuning into the our, you know, our religious advocates and allies, um, because it really does help to bring in different perspectives, not just this Roman Catholic belief about abortion being a sin um, and, and getting these individuals to really help us of other faiths that even, you know, Catholics for choice, exactly. Like there are other people, there are many different beliefs and um, they can really be strong, strong partners when it comes to getting grassroots organization as well as kind of like cutting off the antis, like getting the wind out of their sails basically. Um, yeah, it is really, truly horrifying. And, you know, when you think about um, state funding here in Rhode Island, there was um, a bill that uh, basically was, um, you know, the Choose Life license plates. So there was a bill to have a Choose Life license plate. And then the fee for that bill would go one to like the general revenue fund of the state. But the bulk of it was going to go to uh, two care net facilities. So we saw this legislation and they also like, they just snuck it in. It was at the state that they were like, this one committee was going to hear like literally like 30 different bills and they just snuck in hope like whatever. And we were like, no, <laughs> pounce on that because we were not gonna let that happen. We were not going to allow them to get a cent of money. And you know, part of our argument was like, look, if you want to have a choose life plate, knock yourself out. But why don't you send that money then to some other general fund that will actually like help enable people to have a better life, right? Uh, as opposed to funding this fake clinic that really is uh, just depriving people of the healthcare that they want. Um, so yeah, it's it's infuriating, it's dangerous, but um, you know, like moving on. Um, so. Um, we also have today with us uh, Lyft Louisiana's Michelle um, Ehrenberg, and she is going to share a little bit about how advocates in her state are fighting back. Um, so what are you doing in Louisiana to stop state funding and public money to CPCs? Well, it's been really awesome to listen to everybody going um, uh, first, because I'm going to talk about a little bit of all of this stuff about um, in the context of Louisiana. And I, you know, I really want to acknowledge that a lot of Lyft Louisiana's work on this issue has been informed by the work of my colleagues on this panel. And so I'm really grateful to be part of this. Um, and I definitely will be following up with um, with some folks after this. Um, 
But yeah, so we have been at Lip Louisiana investigating the sources of public funds that are funneled into these fake clinics um, that Ariana spoke about earlier. Um, we're currently working on a report that we will use to educate the public and then members of the legislature in the hopes um, of you know, trying to do something policy-wise to shift funding away from the CPCs and direct it towards programs that are more effective in meeting, um, you know, the goals and also to ensure some more oversight and regulation of the CPC. So we have lots of um, ideas, um, but we, you know, we think that the, the um, really kind of exposing these clinics um, is a, a, an important part of that process um, because the free services <laughs> that the clinics are providing are not free. Um, these are, you know, in most in most cases, um, you know, tax taxpayer dollars that are going in. So we so we started doing some public records requests and reviewing the um, the 990s, like the tax documents of anti-abortion organizations and CPCs. Um, and so what we found in Louisiana is that there are two primary sources of public dollars that are directed at CPCs, and both have been talked about already. So one is the Choose Life License Plate Program um, that was established in Louisiana in 1999, and it allows anybody to purchase this specialty plate. Um, when that passed, originally they set up an advisory council that was sort of a mix of you know, stakeholders, um, CPC and anti-abortion representatives, but also um, people from the state government, and it was a state treasury fund, and so there was public accountability in terms of how it was managed. Um, and that advisory council would, you know, review the grant applications and determine how the funds would be dispersed. Um, but in 2009, the statute was quietly amended to abolish that fund and to transfer the balance of it over to Louisiana Right to Life. Um, and so since then, Louisiana Right to Life has basically just been written a check every single year from this fund um, and they divvy it out to um, crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and so since 2009 and 2019, they've received um, over $400,000 from this program and they provide no public information about the application submission and approval process. There's no oversight of this fund whatsoever. And because you know it, the, it's funding a private entity, um, unless there's, you know, and unless there is a requirement that that um, information be um, reported out, there's no way for the public to access any information about how they are running that program. Um, and we're not the only state, obviously, that has these license plate programs. Um, I think there's at least 32 other states, um, or uh, at least 31 other states. Um, that number includes Louisiana. So then the other source of funding, which is much more lucrative to the CPCs is um, in Louisiana, it's called the Abortion Alternatives Program. It's probably called something similar in your state if you have it. Um, it's administered through the Department of Children and Family Services, but it's funded through TANF, through Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. So most people know this program as welfare, um, but it was, cha it was changed um, significantly in the 90s. Um, under the Clinton administration. Um, and it's still a program that's intended to provide temporary financial assistance to poor families and primarily those, you know, with very limited means of meeting their basic needs. Um, but when it was, um, when the program was changed in the 90s, um, um, it turned into a block grant program and the states could basically spend it however they wanted to, as long as they fulfilled one of four purposes. Um, and so those are providing assistance to needy families, promoting job preparation and work, preventing and reducing out of wedlock pregnancies or encouraging marriage and two parent families. So I'm not really sure how the crisis pregnancy centers meet any of those goals because yeah. if anything, they are encouraging um, out of wedlock pregnancies to, re to use the term um, as it is um, actually defined in the statute um, and in the in the program. Um, <clears throat> so the program in Louisiana claims that it primarily provides information and counseling that promotes healthy childbirth and that it assists pregnant women in their decision regarding adoption or parenting. So that's lifted straight from their 
um, their contract. Um, and, you know, um, I know that Texas is like providing like $100 million um, and, um, and Ariana talked about 6 million in Ohio. Um, we, we're not providing that much funding um, in Louisiana, but we also don't have um, this, the kind of budget. <laughs> um, you know, we're a relatively poor and small state. Um, but since 2011, from what we've been able to um, ascertain, the um, Department of Children and Family Services has awarded well over $11 million to two pr primary agencies, and then um, they subcontract out with crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and these programs, you know, they target low income um, people, they, um, they're targeting, you know, TANF eligible um, pregnant people. Um, uh, they're targeting, you know, pregnant minors and their families, and they are very explicit about that in their um, in their contracts, you know, in their grant um, in their grant uh, applications. Um, and they also, you know, really emphasize pregnant women between the ages of 18 and 29, um, and those who are unmarried. Um, and the other thing that you know I think is really revealing is that they they're we're, they're very specifically not supposed to be um, religious organizations or promoting religion. Um, that that is explicit, but and they claim that they are not. Um, but they are all faith-based organizations or affiliated with faith-based organizations. And obviously, we know from you know anecdotes and people's you know own lived experiences that there is um, a heavy emphasis on. Um, on religion that is, you know, uh, driving and and uh, a lot of the conversations that are ha happening in these clinics um, that they refer to as counseling. Um, so we're still in the process of analyzing the um, financial reporting records that we've received from the state, um, but we can already see some things that I think are, you know, pretty uh, just pretty upsetting or um, infuriating, I guess would be a good word. Um, you know, um, looking at one of these organizations, you know, 35% of the funding that they're receiving is going towards operating expenses and indirect costs. And that's just like bad, <laughs> bad nonprofit management. Um, and, and so some, and some of that includes like tens of thousands of dollars annually that they're spending on public relations, on advertising, on maintaining these CPC websites, um, you know, just as Travis was talking about earlier, you know, it's like you, if you are, if, if you're driving down the road and you're seeing these billboards or you're Googling, you know, abortion in Louisiana and the first three websites that come up are CPCs, um, that is all being funded by uh, taxpayer dollars. Um, and so then the last thing that I, um, you know, want to say is, um, you know, we were really concerned also because a lot of the uh, crisis pregnancy centers in Louisiana do promote this um, abortion pill reversal nonsense. Um, and this year, Louisiana introduced a bill that um, <clears throat> that would have required physicians provide patients with information about abortion pill reversal. Um, we were able to uh, you know, organize uh, a lot of grassroots pushback, a lot of pushback from the medical community, and even pushback from um, the State Department of Health officials. And um, the bill passed, but we amended it to, um, one, ensure that the physicians didn't have to verbally provide that information um, to patients. Um, so it, instead, it's a, basically a piece of paper that they have to staple to a bag. Um, we also made sure that the state health department didn't have to post any information on their website about this nonsense. Um, and we significantly changed the information um, that they wanted to require to remove any reference to the actual abortion reversal protocol that they've been, um, that they've been pushing. So it's still not great, um, but it's, you know, it's a lot better than what was originally introduced. Um, and, you know, one of our big concerns about this is, you know, if they are able to get the state to really promote abortion reversal, then, then, you know, it's just, it's like, it's very easy to see how that could end up being yet another source of public funding that is, you know, going to these CPCs 
um, you know, to, to find that, um, you know, that bad medicine uh, that, they're, that they're pushing on people. Oh, thank you, Michelle. And yes, that is it, bad medicine. Fake, not scientific, bad medicine. And yeah, again, like the thing that I've seen a lot with these clinics is that they do rely on volunteers a lot to do, to provide, you know, a pregnancy test and counseling and things like that. So part of me is wondering, what are they doing with this money? Um, you know, especially for the smaller clinics that do not have, you know, uh, well-developed websites or, you know, pamphlets and things like that. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. And it's, as, as a, taxpayer who believes in paying taxes, it is really upsetting to think about money going to these places. Um, yes, and you know where I want my money to go is to give people comprehensive reproductive health care. Um, so now we're gonna turn to Haley Brand, last but certainly not least from the Hope Medical Group. And, um, Haley is going to tell us a little bit about how clinics and providers are pushing back, uh, pushing back on these myths um, while they're trying to provide compassionate, comprehensive health care. Haley? Hi, everyone. It's been a pleasure to hear everybody speak about what they're passionate about. And it's uh, great to be here as kind of a reminder as why we do this work. And I hope everybody can walk away from this panel with kind of a refresher and keep keep moving forward and pushing on. Um, I am the Director of Patient Advocacy at Hope Medical Group. Uh, so I get to do the real life options counseling. <laughs> Abortion, parenting, adoption. I get to actually work with patients in making their decision and providing them with correct information to ensure that they're making the decision that's best, excuse me, that's best for them. Um, and the best way that we as providers, as clinics, as advocates to kind of push back these myths is providing information. Education is the first step to any intervention. Um, and that's what we're doing is we're intervening in the realm of these fake clinics to ensure that people get the care that they need. Um, so in our options counseling sessions, we're ensuring that we're providing patients with the information that they need um, to make the decision that they need to make in a setting that is compassionate, that's understanding, um, so that they know that people are on their side. The fake clinics that push their own agenda stand on our sidewalk. I, we have patients that come in with little pamphlets from the fake clinics that outnumber in our city alone. There are more fake clinics than there are our one abortion clinic in Shreveport, Louisiana. We see patients come in with these pamphlets because this, the sidewalk protesters are aligned with these fake clinics. So not only do these clinics have these standalone places where patients are harassed. Um, they're also harassed as they're coming in our driveway by these people. Um, so we very much have to um, push back on these myths that these pamphlets are telling them and that these people are yelling at them on the sidewalk about. Um, and a lot of times patients come in here upset, rightfully so, and we have to provide an environment where they can get the information that they need um, so that they can move forward because that's really what's important for them is to be able to get the information they need to be able to move forward in life. So um, as advocates and activists and community members that are right side by side by these clinics, um, how can we support our clinics and how can we ensure that patients are getting where they need to be aside from yellow brick roads and beautiful things like that um, is really talking about it. Panels like this, um, advocates out in the real world, talking to your Aunt Susie, talking to the 
college roommate that one time said something about abortion, having that conversation and removing that negative stigma of what abortion care actually is um, so that people can see the facade that uncovers these fake clinics so that people can get where they really need to be. We really just need to be willing to open our mouths and educate and be willing to say, hold up, this is what's real. That's the most important thing that we can really do as advocates and community members. That's awesome, Haley. I, I, uh, this is one thing that I, so having in the past been a um, clinic escort, and like remembering doing that. I remember that the clinic that I was doing that for, um, which was in a very small town in, well, not a very small town, a smallish town in Indiana. And um, the thing that really bothered me as a clinic escort was that there would always be on our, um, on the days where we actually were providing abortion, there would be tons of protesters there. And part of me was like, wouldn't, would it be helpful for there to be counter protesters there, people to be supportive. And, you know, this is like a conversation that was had back and forth and people are like, well, we don't want this to become a circus, right? This is all about like, people are coming here, some of them on a, you know, after having made potentially a difficult decision in whatever way, whether it was just actually difficult getting to the place or because they just really didn't know what they wanted to do and then they came to a decision without exploiting people. And so it is really hard. And I think there are a lot of people in the community that want to do more for clinics, uh, whatever they can do. And um, I appreciate that talking about it and removing the stigma is like one of the number one things to do. Um, but is there anything else that we can do to like help support your staff? Uh, people that are on the front lines. I think that's where a lot of people come from, that we're just like, God, I just feel so badly like is there anything that I can do to help and make your life a little bit better other than just saying like I'm here to support you and I understand and you know I'm always here if you want to scream honestly it's those we're here for you we support you those make all the difference um we mm -hmm. have clinic escorts they do a phenomenal job and that is a great way to be active in your own communities to kind of because it's, it's not an anti-protest, but like that, that's a very fair statement that you made, that it is a circus. We don't want that attention. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing we want. Um, but having our escorts there with their umbrellas, their, their best coats, um, one of our um, escorts has actually gotten to a point where she rings cowbells um, with her to kind of like counteract the screaming of the protesters <laughs> as they come in. And she's like, shake it in and be in. It's, clinic escorts are great if that's something um, that you're interested in doing it, reach out to your local clinic. They need people. They need people and it's great. It's empowering. It's, it's fun. Um, abortionfunds.org is a great place where you can also donate to your local cl clinic as well. Um, abortion care is not cheap. Um, and if making donations is something that sits well with you, abortionfunds.org is a great um, website that you can go to and find the fund that works with your local clinic. Um, but for real, just letting abortion providers know that we're here for you really does make all the difference. Um, at the clinic we have, um, as at our like clock-in wall, um, we've got a big poster board of all the thank you cards and little notes from patients from our national networks that we work with, just as a reminder that we're not alone. There are people out here who support us, who love what we do, and will continue to share that love and that support forever. Awesome, thank you. Well, I know that I am fired up and ready to go. Um, so uh, we are reaching the end of our discussion. And I kind of would just like, um, everyone to go through and tell me the, the one thing that you would like our audience to take away from today's call. And I'm just gonna start by the square. So we'll start with uh, Caitlin. 
I would say one thing to think about after this panel is if anything in this panel surprised you, that is probably a sign that you should have a conversation with your loved ones about fake clinics. The one thing in my experience that's always um, surprising when we're outside these fake clinics is how often um, we're people who come up to us believe that we are anti-abortion activists, that we're protesting a real clinic. And being there while it's uncomfortable, while it might be hard to have conversations or take direct action, whatever your comfort level is, it is really important um, in reducing the harm that these fake clinics cause in our communities. Awesome. Michelle, what about you? Yeah, I would say, you know, try to try to figure out where the fake clinics are in your community and where the real reproductive health care service providers are, because you know, you may you may be asked by a friend or a family member who is seeking services. Um, and you, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, mistakenly directing them um, to a place where they are going to be shamed and, and traumatized and harassed. Um, and then I also think that, you know, if you have, um, you know, some of these programs that are state funded um, in your state, then, um, you know, reach out to your state legislators and demand that at the very least they are um, auditing these programs and that they're um, doing some sort of oversight of them. Um, and, you know, urge them to to direct funds away from these CPCs um, and into programs that are actually serving women and families in your state. Excellent. Travis? Be that friend. Be that friend that takes what you learned here today and educate your own loved ones and networks. If nothing else, it can feel very disempowering about trying to change the whole country. So just start with your network. Knowledge is power. Awareness is critical. Inoculate your own personal friends, networks, and communities against this rampant disinformation that's out there. Then, most importantly, all of the local organizations mentioned here or, um, or who are represented by speakers here, volunteer with them. Learn what you can do to support them and reach out to your own local um, activist group on reproductive freedom to get involved. Excellent. Amanda? Yeah, I think everyone's give, given some really solid advice. Um, I know that the clinics that Haley and I both work at are independent providers. So we'd like to have folks continue to support the independent providers in their states. Um, and that any opportunity that, opportunity that you have when within the medical community, make sure that they're aware that independent providers are the places where abortion can be spoken about in a very thoughtful manner, a compassionate manner, it's science-based, it's practice-based, um, and to make sure that when you're in your medical community that folks aren't referring to the fake uh, centers, um, and also just making sure that you're staying aware of how you direct your friends and family as well to independent providers um, as sources of community support. Excellent, thank you. Ariana? Um, yeah, I guess don't just dis get discouraged because, um, you know, there's so many different um, avenues that fake clinics and their supporters are going down to black people from getting abortions. And, um, you know, you don't have to fight each one yourself. You know, you can like just narrow in on one thing. If you want to get um, money out of the budget, focus on, you know, electoral and legislative work. Um, or, you know, if you want to just directly help people do some mutual aid, you know, find like a practical support network in your area. Abortion funds usually have those um, to help people get rights to clinics and get diapers and things like that. A really huge part of CPC's programming is providing diapers and other um, like prenatal and infant uh, supplies and needs. Um, so yeah, it's a big battle, but don't, you don't have to fight it all by yourself. And so don't get discouraged. Excellent, yeah. Oh, the diaper thing. Mm -hmm giving away the free diapers, but I have heard reports from clinics that they will only give you like a certain amount of diapers, like basically like a few weeks before you're about to have the child and maybe like a week after. So it's great. Haley, what about you? Kind of to spare off Ariana is that this panel is a good reminder that 
we're not alone. And we're not only, we can't do what we want to do in our communities without the support of people who are on the other side of the United States, um, even. And just knowing that there are people out there who are on your side and whatever you need, we're here, they're there, somebody, somebody is out there to help. Great, thank you. And Heather. Yeah, thanks. Um, echo what everyone has said, and I think doing whatever you can to destigmatize abortion, because um, whether it's having conversation with friends that, that folks have mentioned, um, or doing whatever advocacy makes sense for you, because I think CPCs really rely on there being some stigma around abortion, and if that's not there, um, it makes it a lot harder for them to um, do the work that they're trying to do in, uh, in, a, in a shameful way, treating abortion like it's shameful. And we, we all, I think we all agree on this call that abortion is healthcare and it's, it's not something that people should be ashamed of. Um, I think also, you know, reach out to folks. I don't want to volunteer everyone on the phone, but like reach out to, to the folks um, in the state groups and the national groups that are um, doing this work, whether you are an advocate yourself or someone who's looking to get involved and, um, you know, a lot of folks are open to talking about specific ways that you can you can um, take action uh, that's um, focused narrowly tailored to your state um, and help you figure that out. To help you do the research, you don't have to do all of the things. You know, you can you can lean into what um, the the thing that you're interested in um, uh, and try to support. Uh, move forward policies that actually support pregnant people, um, whatever they, they want to do, whether it's to parent um, or, or, or choose adoption or abortion, because, um, again, if that support is there, CPCs, um, you know, can't really rely on all of that shame and stigma. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, you know, coming from a small state organization, um, when you don't necessarily have a lot of funds, it's it's so important that we do rely on each other to really help. Like whether it's you know looking at the resources that have already been created by Repro Action, or um, looking to see what the Women's Center's playbook was for getting their legislation passed, or the research of like where to look for um, the funding issues in, in other states. I just think it's so important that we do work together and collaborate because that is how like, we know that the um, anti-abortion groups are a well-oiled machine and they're very good with uh, sticking up for each other. So it's so important that we work together and uplift each other. Um, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. I have I learned a lot. I am so jazzed and ready to go and start just taking down these fake clinics. And I really hope that our audiences um, as well, we have so much work to do. Uh, these organizations are all amazing. I encourage everyone here to look into the work of these various organizations, as well as these amazing activists, follow them on social media. Um, like uh, we will be sharing this, um, this recording so that other people can re look at it at another time. Um, I want to thank all of you. Um, I also a big shout out to the Women Project for putting this on, as well as the Louisiana Coalition for Reproductive Freedom, our partner on this series. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Let's just continue working to uh, close these gaps in healthcare and expose these fake clinics and improve outcomes for our community. Thank you so much. Have a great day.